So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to Mary Ann for that gracious introduction. So today I've got two tasks to do. The first is talk about advances in biomarkers for the menopause prediction. And the second, which is much more important, is to thank Mary Ann. Because I started working with Mary Ann in August 1998, almost 20 years. And you can imagine the life events that Mary Ann has had to put up with across those 20 years. Yeah? In terms of actually being able to transition from kind of being a first year at SHO and the Queen Mums with her to being a colleague and professor for the last 10 years, it's been a fantastic opportunity. So I'd like to thank you, Mary Ann, in front of all of your peers for giving me a huge amount of support. But more importantly, I know you won't like the analogy of being that orca killer whale. <laughs> thank you. But actually, we all saw yesterday that orca postmenopausal orca killer whales are leaders and daily show maternal instincts and I'm very grateful for that. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Mary Ann Lumsden. <laughs> so now you know why she's never let me on the stage with her at the same time, despite 20 years of working together. So let's talk about biomarkers. So essentially, when you think about biomarkers and reproductive lifespan, and the ovarian reserve, and across that, I really wanted to put this in the context, I mainly do IVF on a day-to-day -day basis, but I want to be able to put it in the context of the clinical questions we all face. So if we think of the first patient, Cindy, she's 25, and the question that she'll be asking you and me is how long can she wait before she has children? And it all relates to that kind of menopause prediction. She's not actually interested in when she'll go through the menopause, but actually it's her reproductive and fertility she's interested in. But Susan is a 35-year-old who had premature ovarian insufficiency, or her sister and her mum had it, and the big question for her is, will she get it too? And then Gillian is a 32-year-old, and she's had chemotherapy for breast cancer, and she's now wondering whether or not she'll get premature in ovarian insufficiency, or is it a context of actually what adjuvants will she use? Because if she's postmenopausal, she will change and get an aromatase inhibitor, and if she's premenopausal, it's tamoxifen and all the associated side effects of that. What about Mary? She's 47. She's getting some of the symptoms that you've been hearing about over the last you know, day or so. In reality, she's asking, how much longer is this going to go on for? And then lastly, there's Jean, who's 51, and she's actually, she had a period four months ago, and she's now asking, am I menopausal or not? And we heard yesterday about how silly the diagnosis is and being retrospective. So these are situations I would put to you that you are all faced with every day. And it's the context of those situations that that's where menopause prediction really becomes relevant to you. Because they're all inherently related to that reproductive lifespan. So when you think about biomarkers, the reality is that women will transition across their lifetime. And with that transition, there's going to be a change in the number of follicles within their ovary, but the genetics are going to stay constant. So the question that can be is, how can you then be able to address those questions for different people across their lifespan? Because the questions that they may face and it will be quite different. And perhaps we shouldn't be so fixed on that and be using a combination of those things, because the genetics are going to stay constant. So are genetics the answer to us? We know how heritable the menopause is. Well, the largest GWAS studies that have been done, and this is a conventional Manhattan plot, just shows you that even when you take 33 different cohorts, about 70,000 patients, the reality is that you can only get to about 10% of the variance. So then people will say, well, you just need bigger and better studies. And the Reprogen Consortia, which some of you will be part of, will inevitably be able to do that with time and be able to get smaller and more sensitive hits. The next stage was, does it apply across different ethnicities? So John Perry and colleagues did this with the Japanese and took another 70,000 patients from the Japanese populations and looked at what they'd found in the essentially Caucasian Europeans and said, did it replicate? And they looked at two factors, menarche, which is on the top here, and menopause on the bottom. And what they showed was actually it's quite different. Depending on the different populations, they saw different things in terms of the heritability estimates. And not only that, they saw identified new loci. So it was 26 new loci from that Japanese population, despite 67,000 women in the context of that. And what's very clear when you put all that data together is that the 
effect size is tiny for most things. But you'll see that you can see there along the x-axis is how frequent those alleles are, and then the effect size on the y-axis. And it's one or two months. And some will have a year and a big effect, but most are really small. So is that really enough? And I'd put it to you today, the answer is no, it's not. Because even if you take all those risk alleles, and you can see there are 24 to 27 risk alleles, inevitably the odds ratio increases as you go up those you know, stages and you have more risk alleles. But the reality of it is that the odds ratio at the top end versus the bottom is 2.47. And you might think that's rubbish, but actually in terms of whether or not you're a smoker, that only gets about 0.55, so it's better than that, and it's even better you combine that with some biological risk factors. So what I would put it to you is when you all think about that kind of menopausal distribution and the age at which people can go through that menopause, and people all focus on that bottom tail of the premature ovarian sufficiency, the reality of it is when you think about that effect size, and we haven't been able to identify Mendelian traits, the reality is that for a vast majority of these people, it's just going to be small, multiple, multiple hits of that they're going to have, and it's a large effect because of multiple measures, but we're only going to be able to get a hit or a read on those measures when we've got huge GWAS studies, hundreds of thousands of patients having GWAS. So I would suggest that genetics at present can't do it, but they might contribute in the future. So what about ovarian reserve biomarkers? And in the IVF, which we do, we're very accustomed to this. And when you think of the follicles that you've got within the ovary, as they transition from primordial follicles to antral to preovulatory follicles, there's a range of hormones that will drive that. You know, FSH will be the signal coming from, the, from above, but AMH is the big break on that. And if you take an AMH knockout mouse, they'll go through the menopause early. If you give recombinant AMH, delay that fo you know, follicle depletions in terms of chem for chemotherapy. And then as they move through the later stages with inhibin B and estradiols, you can be able to image them on ultrasound. And that's one of the problems, is that people have always thought about AMH, but Richard Anderson, who's going to speak next, coined the phrase that it might be the functional ovarian reserve or ovulatory potential, it's not the true ovarian reserve. Because in reality, it's been made by those follicles that are five to eight millimeters in size. But because there's that continuous conveyor belt, the reality is that it also direct, indirectly affects the primordial follicle counts. And the correlation coefficients from Hansen and colleagues is about 0.7, so it's phenomenal. But you have to remember that it's a readout of later stages of follicular genesis. And anything that alters that will have an impact. So one of the problems with the AMH situation has been the evolution of the assays. And depending where you are in the world, you will have experienced all of these assays, potentially, as they've moved through them. And in Europe and you know, Canada, we're accustomed to that, having the automated platforms. In America, it's still not registered with the FDA, so you know, there's the ANCH sort of assays that are, came out there. Most of those antibodies will use the same antibodies. So the full automated ones from Beckman, Coulter, and, and Roche use the exact same antibody, just different assays systems within their Roche analyzers or the Beckman Coulter access analyzer. The ANCH assays is a completely different antibody. And because of that, they've also got different standardizations, so they all give slightly different values. So when you look at papers, the problem is it's very difficult to extrapolate a value from one paper and then put it into the context of another one. And the World Health Organization are recognizing this and they're tasking with trying to get an international standard that all the manufacturers can agree to. But we're not quite there yet. So when we think about values of how to interpret and predict menopause, as I'll show you, they need to be assay specific. We do have good reference ranges from really healthy individual women. And this is just one for the Alexis and similar ones for, for Ansh and Beckman Coulter. But the advantage of that is that we know for Roche, certainly, is that they've validated it across different populations, both Japanese populations and Chinese populations, and they have the exact same values. And others have looked at African and Caribbeans, and it's the same results. Genetic ethnicity does not alter your AMH, so you can all use the same reference ranges. You can also measure AMH on any day of the cycle. The original studies were suggested that there might be a slight blip, you know, around about ovulation, just because it's got that follicular genesis. But studies that we've done in much larger populations now, and we'll present at ESRI, more than 1,300 women, show that it's absolutely flat. It doesn't matter why not. 
And why not you measure it today or in August, you'll get almost the same value. The correlation coefficients are above 0.9. But things that alter follicular genesis do change it. So smoking reduces it. And you can see here the impact that smoking ha has on it. But you stop smoking and you'll get a recurrence in that. But you all know that because smoking puts you through the menopause a wee bit earlier. The other thing is if you're on any form of contraception, it doesn't matter if it's hormonal, it will have an impact and it will have an, reduce the overall AMH values. You stop this, follicular genesis restarts, and you know, within one or two months, are we back up at normal levels again? And there's been lots of debate about whether or not adiposity has an effect on AMH levels. We did a big study you know, in 15-year-old girls with DEXA-determined fat mass and showed no effect whatsoever. And then Dolman and colleagues also did it in these older populations on the graph that's in the right, and again found no measure with adiposity. So we can be pretty sure with big numbers, and there's a third cohort, so with thousands of patients, we can be sure that there's not an effect on AMH. But again, chronic diseases affects it. So you know that, for example, people with lupus have you know, lower AMH values because they're ill. And we've looked in children and shown that actually how ill a children is and how high their pyrexia is and how high their CRP and ESR are will correlate with the reduction in their AMH values. And then more recently, we've just looked at transplants in Glasgow and other chronic kidney disease, and again, it's lower values. And it's not surprising, things that will have an impact on follicular genesis and make you less likely to get pregnant will all reduce your AMH. So the point is, I show this, is that when we think about how we interpret AMH, we need to make sure that they're not on contraception or we're trying to inflate that value artificially and they're fitting well. But can you use them to break the menopause despite all those limitations? Well, the kind of the gold standard was ask your mum. Not ask your mum did the AMH predict the menopause. <laughs> she might have guessed yes. You know, she's, she's not with us anymore, but my mum might have said yes. You made a lifetime career out of it. But reality was, is it better than that? That's the first thing. And so this beautiful study, from, again, from Dolman and Frank Brookman's group, was the first one to look at that. and looked at the age of the woman itself and showed that the hazard risk goes up as your AMH went down. And then what's the age of the menopause? And what they did was they essentially looked, and just in univariate analysis, you can see there the increments in those C statistics as you go from daughter's age to mother's age at natural menopause, that is, to the mother's daughter's AMH herself. And there's an increment in value of that. And then the best model was when you kind of combined all of those things together. So this was the very first study that said, actually, don't bother asking about your mum. Don't ask, bother asking about your date of birth. Actually, just measure your AMH, and we'll have a better chance of predicting when you go through the menopause. And that's what, you know, this was five years ago. So where are we now? People have done a prospective longitudinal cohorts, and this is, what, again, one of the first ones. It was on about 257 women. Tiny numbers, in reality. And what they looked at was... Put AMH trends, and the fifth percentile is at the bottom there, and the 95th percentile is at the top. And then said, what happens to these women, and we follow them up as they go through the menopause. And what it showed was that women who had a low specific AMH for their age went through the menopause earlier, as compared to those who had a higher AMH. But what I want to draw your attention to is look how wide that distribution is. In reality, yeah, you, that fifth percentile was about 45 but it could be 35 or it could be 55. So in terms of a prediction model, it's not exactly what you're wanting with huge confidence intervals. But it was suggesting low AMH is bad news. And then others have gone on to look at being able to look at the rate of decline. Perhaps if we measure sequential AMH measurements across that woman's lifetime, can we get a more accurate measure of that? But you can see there that there's a convergence of AMH as you get older. And although there's pretty good correlation between those two, the reality is that it is different for each woman. They don't have the same trajectory because there's a convergence as they get older. So again, being able to utilize that information might suggest that perhaps as the rate of fall can give you some other information, but that, again, it's not going to be on a one-only measurement. And then people have tried to validate it. So the data from Iran versus data from you know, the Netherlands, and saying, well, actually, do those prediction models converge? 
And what you can see there is that despite the different confounding structures across these two different populations, as women get older, the chances of that model actually replicating get better, as shown there by the bottom right panel where the aim is women are over 40. And so people have tried to do that individualized prediction. And if you look at this kind of scale here of the probability of menopause within the next five years on the y-axis and AMH and nanograms per mil in the bottom, and to convert from nanograms to picomoles, you multiply by seven. So one nanogram per mil is 7.14 picomoles per liter. Two is 14. So to be able to put that into context, the reality is yeah, it looks like it's pretty good in terms of prediction if you're 45, 47, 48. But what, let me just draw your attention to these younger ages where actually you can see that despite your AMH looking almost undetectable there, you've got a relatively low probability of being through the menopause in the next five years. So how do we put it back and bring it back to those clinical scenarios that you all face? So the first one was thinking about that POI. You have patients have come into you with Susan, for example, who's got an FSH of eight, but her sister and her mother both have POI, and she's asking, will I get POI? Well, we know from, you know, Freeman and colleagues just published this year using the Nurses Health Study that actually when you do prospective longitudinal work, women who have got a risk of POI and develop POI do have lower AMH values, substantively lower than that. So the reality is if Susan does have a low AMH, she's a much higher risk of having POI than if she wasn't, and you can do that in an age-specific manner for her. To the extent that for each 0.1 nanogram per mil lower, it's a 14% higher. So it's 0.1 nanograms. So it's a tiny amount. So you can imagine, as she starts to deviate away from that, the risk goes up substantively for her developing POI. So actually, I think we can do better than just the FSH using AMH for patients like Susan. The second patient will be Cindy. So she's 25 and wants to know, how long can I wait to have children? And you all appreciate that younger is better, always in that context, particularly if you want to have more than one child. There's a big paper in JAMA last year, which was followed up for 12 months and showed that AMH did not predict the chance of you conceiving spontaneously within 12 months of follow-up. But as you now know, AMH only predicts ovulation. So you can have an AMH almost undetectable and still be ovulating every month. So of course, it's not surprising, given there's not relatively no association with egg quality, that it doesn't predict the chance of you conceiving spontaneously. But think about the consultation that you will have with Cindy if you get her AMH and it comes back and it's here at 25. You know, in terms of where she thinks about it and where she will think in terms of her reproductive lifespan. And she's, you know, I've just started work out of university into my new jobs. When can I do it? In contrast to now, Cindy's down at one picamole per litre. So really at the limits of sensitivity, and in terms of an IVF cycle, that means that she's probably going to get one egg. Despite how hard we stimulate her, it'll be one egg. So it's not that we have an impact on her just now in terms of thinking about her, you know, whether or not she'll get pregnant, because she may well conceive spontaneously, and that'd be fantastic. But what is very clear is if Cindy subsequently needs IVF, she's at real risk of being a poor responder and having that cycle cancelled and having to move on to alternative strategies. And you can imagine that the consultations as IVF doctors that we have now are quite different because we can pictorially represent where they'll sit within that. And we no longer have the disasters whereby we tell people, we don't know how you respond, we can actually accurately inform them in advance of the number of eggs they're going to get. And also for Cindy, not only have your children later, but actually your real risk of POI as well. And what about Gillian, she's 32, and she's got chemo, and she's thinking about, will I get POI after my breast cancer treatment? So in a beautiful paper in Lancet Oncology from Richard and colleagues, he graphically represented three different patients, shown here by the green line, the blue line, and the red line. And if you think of that spectrum of AMHs that you can have within any given age, 
given that there's a hundredfold difference in the number of follicles they've got within their ovaries for two women of the exact same age. You can see there that they're all going to decline as they get older, and then they're all going to have their treatment for cancer, and it's going to be a massive decrease with that with the chemotherapy, because chemotherapy kills off follicles. And then there's, for some of those people, if they started high with a good ovarian reserve, they'll take that hit, but then they'll come out of it and recover afterwards. They're still going to be lower than where they started with, but they're not going to be below the POI threshold. In contrast, the second patient, again, with the blue line, is going to be above that. But the third patient, who had the low ovarian reserve to start with, gets the same insult as the other two ladies, but she's now post-treatment is below that POI threshold, and she's been caused chemotherapy-related amenorrhea. So it's a beautiful concept, which relates to the biology, but it wasn't until Richard and colleagues followed that up that we actually had a proof of that model. So this was taking an observational cohort for breast cancer, where they were following women up for two years. And what they were interested in was the baseline treatment samples, end of treatment, which is the EOT, 12 months or 24 months, did that predict why not you'd be amenorrheic at two years later after the end of your treatment? And you can see there that estradiol wasn't really useful. It might be lower, as you'd expect. FSHs, well, certainly they would go up. And those who were postmenopausal after that, as a consequence of that, they certainly had high values. But what was critical here is this bar that you can't actually see that the AMH at the end of treatment was undetectable. And what Richard showed was, was an aid-modifying mod effect. So in particularly in those women over the age of 40, you've got a fantastic diagnostic test. You can do a sample at the end of treatment with a diagnostic odds ratio of 42. So suddenly we can be able to say to women, actually, perhaps we should be changing how you manage you post-treatment and think of what different adjuvants that we can be doing and really setting their lifetime expectations. And then the third patient is Mary, who's kind of 47, and how much longer is she going to have these symptoms for? So I'm very grateful for Nanette Santoro, um, who hopefully is here, for giving me the access to the SWAN data. And she very graciously gave me these slides from that, which she presented at ASRM last year. But what it shows is that, you know, as you all expect, is going up FSH with the SWAN cohort, as the age of the final menopause, which is shown by that dotted line, that there is a rise in FSH. But the correlation coefficient is about 0.4. Estradiols, there's a, a bit of fluctuation with that, but it's not great. And in terms of being able to predict final menopause, it's far from ideal. What Amy Swan is fantastic at is its multi ethnicity. I and mean, I've shown you already that it doesn't matter in terms of AMH. And Annette and colleagues have shown that again in Swan, that it doesn't matter in terms of ethnicity. But this is just the decline in AMH, so they're using the Ange Pico acid, so the most sensitive assay, that was, you know, manual assay that's on the market. And what it shows is that decline was repeat multiple measurements in terms of being able to work that out. And then being able to come up with a value was thinking about actually what's the chances of you being menopausal based on an AMH. And those bottom two lines or rows of the table, you're really operating at the limits of sensitivity. Although there's a kind of almost a tenfold difference between these two, the assay probably can't differentiate between the two. And that's why it's, the values are almost identical. And you can see there, though, that even if you've got an AMH, up to about 90% of the population could take up to two years to have that final menstrual period. But just like Richard's data showing the age-modifying effect for the POI prediction, Lynette and colleagues saw this for the SWAN data, where AMH was much more predictive in older women above the age of 50. Not 40 here, but 50. And you can see there that if you've got undetectable AMHs or low AMHs, you're much more likely to be going through the menopause sooner rather than later. So it doesn't look like one marker can do it. And that's not surprising. When you think of other risk scores, we often combine things that are slightly independent. So can we do the same for menopause prediction? Well, Yang and colleagues suggested that actually just using FSH, 
You could, using latent phase analysis and latent class analysis, you could differentiate these people who had early rises in FSH and then later rises in FSH. So just by measuring FSH at age 40 or 45. And Easter dial is shown here with the red lines. So we've done this in ALSPAC, which is a large birth cohort recruited in 1990, and those women are now menopausal. And we've got more, over 3,000 measurements, and we've done repeat annual measurements on those women. And then we've modeled it, and we've modeled it here with FSH, LH, SHBG, and Easter dial. And what it shows is that you can bring, as you'd expect, SHBG is constant, LH and FSH are going up because it's a logarithmic scale on the y-axis, and AMH is declining massively as you get older, and it's all the same if you model it on the final menstrual period. So perhaps, just as was proposed by Yang and colleagues in BMC, was you could combine them. So you take about that latent phase analysis, or latent class analysis, and you combine it with the AMHs and smoking status, and you can start to see a divergence in results. And then if you have a late phase, you can see also see a further divergence in results. So we don't need to rely on just one biomarker. We can perhaps combine three with a phenotype. And this is the first thing, example of that. What about diagnosing the menopause? Because it's incredibly frustrating, I think, for lots of women to find out, am I in the menopause or am I not in the menopause? And actually, it's the uncertainty of that. And you can say, well, I'll be able to tell you the answer in 12 months' time. That really seems pretty un you know, satisfactory. So Mary Ann, when she chaired the NICE guidelines on menopause, hard work, and looked at all the tests that were available, and actually said, they're all useless. The only one that shows here in terms of positive likelihood ratio anywhere near 100% was if you're over 60. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> at the other extreme of the graph was the menstrual and hormonal algorithms. And I've shown you some data that wasn't in the NICE guidelines, but I think will be in the future. So they said, don't bother testing anything. Don't bother measuring FSH if you're above the age of 45. I don't think that message has really got out across the world as yet. I'm sure it's FSH test been every day for patients, and it's only a value less than that. But what perhaps we're thinking is, why do we need to think of just the hormones? We've seen other changes that you're all experts in. So this is a paper we published with BMC Medicine earlier this year using an NMR platform that measures 240 different metabolites. And what we were interested in was, is it an age effect or is it a menopause transition effect? And what we showed was that actually it's, you know, there's a separate effect from the menopause apart from just getting older. But you've got suddenly 240 different biomarkers from lipid subclasses to amino acids to glucose to fatty acids. We've got all of them. And then we've also got these hormones that we've measured within that. We've got a whole lot of other biomarkers we've measured within the SALSPAC cohort. So actually, can we start to combine those? But that is well beyond many of our maths. So what we did was we took an artificial learning approach and with machine learning and said, OK, let's put it into a model with a tenfold validation. And actually, we get pretty good predictive statistics with that. But we're going to need your help and others to be able to validate that model because we've got this internal validation, but it's externally. Now, if you think that area under the curve doesn't look that great, that's better than any model for diabetes. And it's better than any model for cardiovascular risk. So you think... So the gentlemen who are in the audience who are on statins, the model you use to decide whether or not you've got a statin isn't anywhere near as good as this one. So I think the future for prediction and diagnosis is going to be a personalized risk assessment. But we're going to be able to combine things together. We're going to take that kind of concept of approach that people transition across their lifetime. And there's the dynamic biomarkers that are going to reflect that ovarian reserve. And then there's the constant genetics that underlie all of that. And we'll be able to create a polygenic risk score for the chances of them going through the menopause and at the timing of that menopause. And then we can combine it with other biomarkers, novel ones that perhaps I haven't thought about in terms of the lipid changes and across this medium. We've heard all sorts of different things that have been measured in the context of the menopause. And perhaps they can add value as well as something like AMH. And then we're going not going to forget that actually we can just ask the patient some questions as well. And actually, do you smoke or do you not smoke? And then we can combine all of that together to get that personalized risk assessment. So it's going to be 
a combination of their baseline genetics and the additional biomarkers and then other risk factors. And I appreciate you might think that's just never going to happen. I take a blood test, I send it to the lab and I get a result back. But when you think about how we've evolved in terms of how we use technology. So in, in IVF, we now have apps that will tell us the dose of gonadotrophins based on AMH and body weight. And doctors all around the world now are using that app to accurately dose and individualize the dose of that. We use apps on our phone to get risks for bone, for diabetes, for cardiovascular disease. The labs can make this easy for you. They'll just do it all and report you back the result. You're not going to need to do that. So don't worry. <laughs> so to conclude, I'm sorry they all came up together. At present, genetics just don't explain adequate variance of the age of menopause. I say it's different for different populations, but about 36%, nowhere near as good as asking your mum. You can measure AMH, and we can do it reliably and robustly, and the problems with the assays have now been resolved, but they're assay-specific values. But you have to bear in mind that it's follicular genesis, and therefore it reflects follicular genesis, and factors that disrupt follicular genesis will reduce your AMH. AMH is associated with age at natural menopause. Just measuring a single measure, you can have a stab at it, but you have massive wide confidence intervals. The exception is when it becomes extremely low and it's almost undetectable. And in that context, what you're worried about is POI. What you're also worried about is if they've had chemotherapy, is that you can then say they're going to be, you know, chemotherapy-related amenorrhea. And I think the future, and we've seen it in other parts of medicine, it's just a matter of time that comes to obstetrics and gynecology, is combining and working together as teams using biomarkers that we can measure in blood samples, the genetics that we can routinely access now with 23andMe and others being able to do that, and then still asking the important questions. When did your mum go through the menopause? How old are you? And do you smoke? Simple things that will add value to that. So that only leaves me to thank a fantastic team I get to work with in Glasgow. So Mary Ann, who you all know well, some of the other members you perhaps don't know well, Martina Elidromite, who's going to speak on Saturday on POI, and has been a fantastic, I had a real pleasure of Martina being a lecturer for several years, and she's about to transition into her senior lectureship this summer, fantastic. Jen Sassarini, who you won the prize yesterday in terms of the Green Black Prize, and so drinks are on Jen tonight. <laughs> And then obviously, you know, Debbie Lawler, who leads the Alspac cohort, Richard Anderson, who you're going to meet next, and we've done lots of stuff together with. And then last but not least, Nanette Santoros. Thank you very much, Nanette, for giving me access to this one data. Thank you. Thank you.